Hey, how's it going? And welcome back to Consuming Cinema, a show about making and pairing food and drinks from popular movies and TV shows. This week, in honor of Halloween, we're doing a slightly different format on the show. So today, we'll find out what pairs best with cilantro crawfish gumbo. Is it a J&B straight and a Corona? Or is it a double absolute martini from American Psycho. If you haven't seen American Psycho, it's a 2000 satirical slasher comedy directed by Mary Heron and based on the 1991 Bret Easton Ellis novel of the same name, which follows Patrick Bateman, a wealthy yuppie investment banker in 1980s New York whose life revolves around appearances with his fiancée Evelyn, taking pristine care of his body, wearing expensive suits, dining on lavish dinners, and comparing business cards with his people. But when he's not maintaining his aristocratic facade, Patrick is secretly a cold-blooded, psychopathic murderer, with one victim being his business associate Paul Allen, who confuses Patrick with another co-worker and has a way nicer business card than him. That subtle off-white coloring, the tasteful thickness of it, oh my god. It even has a watermark. But before Patrick murders Paul, they dine at a restaurant called Texarkana, mainly because Patrick couldn't get a reservation at Dorzia. Nobody goes there anymore. There, Paul berates a waiter over his favorite dish. No, I want to know. Okay, I came here for the cilantro crawfish gumbo, all right, which is, after all, the only excuse one can have for being in this restaurant, which is, by the way, almost completely empty. I'm very sorry, sir. JMB straight and a Corona. Would you like to hear this? Double absolute martini. Yes, sir. Would you like to hear the specials? Not if you want to keep your spleen. But before we get to those drinks, we first have to make our gumbo. And any good gumbo starts with a good roux, which is a simple combination of one cup of oil as well as one cup of flour, which we'll gradually whisk into our hot oil. And you just want to simply stir this roux. I used both a whisk and a silicon spatula, alternating in between the two. And you want to stir this roux constantly because if you stop for even a brief moment, it could cause your roux to burn. So remember, just keep stirring, just keep stirring, stirring, stirring. What do we do? We stir. And if you need a break from stirring, there's no shame in tagging in a loved one as I did with Bailey here. And we want this roux to get to a deep chocolatey color, which is crucial for an authentic gumbo. And once it reaches that rich chocolatey color, you can now start your gumbo. But what I'm going to do is transfer this roux to another dish and refrigerate it overnight while I make the other parts of the gumbo. Now, it wouldn't be a cilantro crawfish gumbo without crawfish, of course, with these crawfish being pre-cooked and frozen. And I got my crawfish online from the Louisiana Crawfish Company. I'll put a link for the Louisiana Crawfish Company below if you want to order some crawfish yourself. So all we need to do to peel these crawfish is first fill up a large stock pot halfway with water and bring it to a boil. And while the Louisiana Crawfish Company does ship live crawfish, I bought frozen ones that simply needed to de-thaw and be reheated briefly. And once the water comes to a boil, we will simply add a little bit of this crawfish at a time. And after only a minute or so, we will pull them from the hot water and put them into a bowl. And then we'll repeat this process with the rest of our crawfish, reheating each batch and putting the warmed crawfish into the bowl to be peeled. And once the crawfish is reheated, we are then going to discard this water before we peel our crawfish. Now, to peel our crawfish, we want to twist off the head of each of them and then peel the shell off from around the tail. And then you want to remove the vein as you would with shrimp. So continue beheading each crawfish as if they're Paul Allen. I chopped Allen's fucking head off. And make sure that you suck out the juices from inside of the crawfish heads as they're the most delicious part. I ate some of their brains. But because this was such a large batch of crawfish to peel, I had Bailey come and help me out. Although she refused to peel this crawfish with her bare hands, and instead she used... What is that, Bailey? What are you wearing there? Is that a rain glove? Yes, Patrick. Yes, it is. So I tried the gloves too, but ultimately I found out that I preferred peeling the crawdads without them. Then, after a while, we finally peeled all five pounds of the crawfish, which actually only amounted to roughly half a pound of tail meat. Now we're going to set aside our meat, and with our discarded heads and shells, we are going to make a stock. And in addition to these shells, we are also going to add the back and spine of a chicken, which we broke down in 
in our Popeye's chicken episode that you can watch here. So we'll add those chicken parts to our pot, and then we're also going to add some celery, some carrot, and some onion, all of which should be roughly chopped, as well as a bushel of thyme. So fill up a large stock pot with water, and we're just going to cover this and bring it to a boil. But before I did, I realized I forgot to add two bay leaves. Then, after a quick stir and a quick picture for our consuming cinema Instagram, I covered the stock again and brought it to a boil. And once it comes to a boil, we're now going to begin the process of skimming the scum off the top of the stock. So we'll just let that stock simmer, every now and then repeating the process of skimming off the fat. And it was at this point that I realized that I forgot to add a few cloves of garlic, which I recommend doing at the beginning. So we'll go ahead and stir that in. And when the stock smelled and looked just about ready, I strained some into a bowl and gave it a little taste test. And I knew from its heavenly and comforting flavor that it was ready to roll. So I set the stock aside and I grabbed another pot to start the actual gumbo, which begins with a pound of andouille sausage. I'm using this Como's brand, which like my crawfish, I got sent through the mail through the Louisiana Crawfish Company. And we simply want to slice these sausages and brown them in a pot. And as they brown, we'll give them a stir. And once you notice a little bit of fond developing on the bottom of the pot, we're going to deglaze the pot with a little beer. I'm using a red ale, specifically Evil Dead Red from Alesmith, which, while not inspired by this movie, is still on the horror movie theme. And once those sausages are nicely browned, we're going to transfer them into a bowl, after which we'll then roast up some okra, which will help dry it out and reduce its sliminess. And we're just going to roast this okra for 5 to 10 minutes at 350 degrees, and while we do, we're going to add our roux, which I admittedly forgot to press record for at the beginning of this shot. And once that roux heats up, we're then going to add the first part of our holy trinity, which consists of celery, green bell pepper, and onion, which will be the first part of the trinity that we'll add to our roux. So stir those onions around into the roux and allow them to soften a bit. And while they do, I want to mention to be careful with this roux, because this stuff is often called Cajun napalm for a reason, and can burn you really easily if you're not careful. Now at this point, we're going to add the other two-thirds of our trinity, the celery and the bell pepper. And we'll go ahead and cook those in our roux as well. And then, after those cook for a little bit, we're going to add our okra, which is now dried out and lost a good bit of its sliminess. So we're going to go ahead and mix that all together. And then I'm going to add a little bit more of the beer to deglaze the pan. Then we'll stir that in. Next, I'm simply going to add a few ladles of stock, one at a time, until I reach the thickness that I'm going for. You want your gumbo to be on the thicker side, but you don't want it to be too dense. So I continued to thin out the gumbo, but as I did, I realized I forgot one important ingredient, a few cloves of chopped garlic, which ideally should be added around the time of the veggies. I then added a little bit of Worcestershire sauce, and yes, it's pronounced Worcestershire, but be careful not to add too much because you can always add, but you can't subtract. I also added a little bit of hot sauce. In this case, I'm using crystal, and stir that in as well. Next, I added a tablespoon of an ingredient called gumbo filet, which is actually ground sassafras, and acts as another thickening agent in a gumbo, followed by some cayenne pepper, and we'll stir that around as well. And then I wanted to add some coriander, because coriander is the ground up seeds of cilantro. And that way, we're able to impart some of that cilantro flavor, because this is a cilantro crawfish gumbo after all before then adding a bay leaf, as well as a little bit more Worcestershire, in addition to a bit more of that coriander. I then added a few more spices, including a little bit of cumin, some dry thyme, a bit of onion powder, in addition to a little granulated garlic, as well as some dry oregano, followed by some smoked paprika, well, as much of it as I had left at least, in addition to some white pepper, as well as some freshly cracked black pepper. Then I mixed that all together, after which I added just a bit more of that stock, followed by our pre-cooked andouille sausage, and stir that in, as well as some freshly chopped thyme. So give that another stir. I then covered this gumbo one more time and let it simmer for a little bit, before then adding back in our crawfish tails. But first, I wanted a little more protein in this, so I added half a pound of peeled and deveined shrimp. Now, these shrimp are going to cook very quickly, so once you see them get a little smaller and turn pink, we are then going to add back in our crawfish tails, 
and stirred those in as well. And finally, I added just a little bit of salt to taste, as well as a little freshly cracked pepper. And once we stir this around, we're then going to let that gumbo simmer while we head on over to plate. And to plate our gumbo, we'll need a plate with a bowl on it. And into this bowl, we will add a scoop of white rice. And onto this rice, we'll add a few ladles of our cilantro crawfish gumbo, after which we'll add one more scoop of rice on top. And then we're simply going to top this gumbo with, of course, a little freshly chopped cilantro, as well as a little chopped green onion, and we'll garnish with a crawfish I saved from earlier. Now we'll set that gumbo to the side while we make our drinks, the first of which is our double absolute martini, which I'm actually going to unconventionally shake. So first we'll add three ounces of our absolute vodka, which I found to be a fitting choice for the film, as absolute was a vodka that gained tremendous popularity in the 1980s due to an aggressive marketing campaign in major metropolises like New York. And then we're also going to add one ounce of dry vermouth. Now for our JMB straight, we're going to need two ounces of JMB scotch or just Arenian Brooks, which is an English wine and spirit merchant that has supplied alcohol to every British monarch since King George III in 1761, which I found to be similarly fitting for the aristocratic themes of this movie. For our martini, we'll add some ice to our big tin, and for our JMB, we'll simply add a cube of ice to our mixing glass because while I shake this martini, a drink that is ordered straight is similar to one ordered neat, only that it has been chilled and slightly diluted by stirring the alcohol with ice like so. Now into a chilled martini glass, we will double strain our double absolute martini, then similarly into a rocks glass, we'll strain our JMB straight, after which we'll garnish that martini with a twist of lemon, expressing the oils over the drink, and last but not least, we'll crack open a Corona to go with our JMB. And at long last, your cilantro crawfish gumbo is finally done. But we still have to answer what pairs best with it. Will it be the JB straight and a Corona? Or will it be a double absolute martini? So first, we're going to take a bite of our cilantro crawfish gumbo, making sure that we get some of that crawfish, some of the rice, and of course, some of that andouille. And right off the bat, I have to say that this is some seriously phenomenal gumbo. I've actually made a number of gumbos in my life, but this one certainly tops them all. I also like my gumbo to have a little bit of hot sauce, so I made sure to get a bite with the hot sauce, and of course a bite with some of that juicy plump shrimp. And what makes this gumbo so outstanding is its tremendous depth of flavor. The crawfish are like little tender bombs of deliciousness, and the andouille is spectacular and smoky and not too spicy, and it's all backed up by that dark, flavorful brew, which gives the gumbo a rich, deep complexity. But now we must find out what pairs best with this cilantro crawfish gumbo. So we'll start with a sip of Paul Allen's Double Absolute Martini, and I honestly was pretty surprised with how well this martini turned out. And if you're not a fan of gin martinis, like the one we made in our Moonstruck episode you can watch here, I recommend giving a vodka one a shot, as it's a much cleaner and lighter flavor profile. That light, crisp freshness and touch of acidity is actually a really nice compliment to this heavy, rich, and spicy gumbo. But how does the J&B and Corona compare? Well, first I took a sip of the J&B, which is slightly sweeter than a typical scotch, but it still has that signature scotch smokiness, both of which pair really nicely with the smoky savoriness of the gumbo. But I still need to try a sip of Corona with the gumbo. And of course, what is a Corona without a lime? So we'll juice a little of that lime into the Corona, and we'll give it a sip, as well as another bite of our gumbo, and another sip of J&B for good measure. And it was pretty clear at this point who the real winner was. Kudos to you, Patrick Bateman. <laughs> Another martini, Paul. Because while the martini did a nice job of cutting through the richness and fattiness of the gumbo, the flavors of that sweet, smoky J and B and the refreshing, acidic, slightly bitter Corona are really such a tremendous pairing with this gumbo. The Corona in particular is a wonderful compliment. That said, you really can't go wrong pairing either of these drinks with a gumbo this good. So it goes without saying that no matter what you choose to pair with your cilantro crawfish gumbo, it will definitely be worthy of two thumbs up. If you like the channel, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Please leave any video suggestions in the comments below. Full recipes will be included in a link in the video description. Follow us on all forms of social media at Consuming Cinema. And don't forget to join us next week when we make a pairing from Once Upon a Time in Mexico. And as always, thank you for watching.